All right, you'll find that statement in uh, the book of Malachi. Uh, that's the last book in the Old Testament, just before Matthew. Uh, if you'd like to go there, Matthew chapter 2. We'll read a section from verse 13 down to verse 16. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion, and your wife by covenant. But not one who has done so, who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, and that word uh, wrong there uh, means violence or injustice, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. That, my friends, is a very potent statement and leaves us in no doubt as to what God thinks about unlawful divorce. God hates divorce. The reason God hates divorce are twofold. One, God ordained marriage was one man joined to one woman as one flesh for life. Genesis chapter 2, 22 to 24. That was the standard. That's what God wanted from the very beginning. Because the men in Malachi's day were justifying their divorces on the grounds that the Lord said, for he who hates his wife shall divorce her, um, they were justifying their divorces on that grounds. And God hated that. The stone edition, Tanakh, of the English version of the Hebrew Bible translates Malachi 3.16, For he who hates his wife should divorce her, says Hashem, master of legions. Guard your spirit and do not commit betrayal. The translators make the one who hates in this verse to be the husband and not God. That to me goes against the whole tenor of Malachi chapter 2, 13 through 16. They put the twisted words of an unrighteous people into the Lord's mouth. Contrary to what the context is saying, into the Lord's mouth as if he is saying, go ahead and divorce your wives if you hate them. And by so doing, they would then have God's approval for their unlawful divorces. But God, who bound together the couple in the contract of marriage, had taken their covenant vows very seriously, a lot more seriously than they obviously had taken those marriage vows. He says, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. God in this context, is not encouraging them to divorce their wives. He is reproaching them for divorcing their wives. God hates divorce. Friends, take heed. Marriage is a serious business, and everyone who takes the marriage vows should do it with gravity. Not flippantly like it's done in the present day, but with real gravity, knowing the seriousness of marriage and the commitment and the covenant that has been made between two people. Let's have a quick look at what Moses has to say on marriage and divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Now, of course, Moses gave the law 
And we're not under the law of Moses anymore. We're under the law of Christ, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But still, the two are connected. The law of Moses and the gospel of Christ are connected. There is a connection. Jesus lived under the law and Jesus was the one who would explain the law the way God intended it to be explained. Moses says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favour in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, and if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you, as an inheritance. Now, the difficulty with this is the word indecency. And it has been the subject of much debate among the Jews as to what indecency means. Even though there has been this debate, we know Divorce was serious because when the divorced wife left her husband's house and became another man's wife, she was considered by God to be defiled. The first husband could not take her back. Again, Moses did not specify what the word defiled meant. So again, there's controversy. But whatever it meant, it was serious. Serious enough that the first husband could never take her back. Jump from what Moses says now back up to the time of Malachi. In the time of Malachi, indecency was taken by unrighteous men who were looking for a way out of their marriage as something in the wife that caused him to hate her. See, each generation would uh, define it, the indecency, for their own convenience, for their own ends, instead of trying to work out what pleased the Lord. But what would have pleased the Lord was that they continued in their marriages and be faithful to their spouses until the very end, till death do us part. That's what would have pleased the Lord. What they were doing here in divorcing for all their own reasons was contrary to God's will. Now it suited people because we create such messes in our lives that we, uh, and even in our married lives, that uh, we somehow have to get away from it, run away from it, change it, so that we're not bothered by, what, by the mess that we've created. But God wants us to clean up our messes properly and to sort out our problems and to do what is right by each other in whatever circumstances we're in. That's what God would want from us. But how do people who start out loving each other end up hating each other? Marriage, it seems, after many years, becomes predictable and humdrum. The hardships of life also tend to knock the sparkle out of marriage. This, in turn, causes the wife and the husband to feel hard done by. Bitterness may enter in and inevitably one or both start looking around lustfully 
for an exciting relationship to replace their empty marriage. This is what leads to dealing treacherously with our spouse. Or this is where dealing treacherously with our spouse comes from. The people of God, ourselves included, and I'm talking about those people back in that day and time as well. There were people of God back, back in that day and time. The people of God should recognize the predictable and hum, humdrum scenario in their lives. No use denying it. Face it. And ask the question, is there anything we can do about this? We need to ask each other, is there anything we can do about this? Or are we just going to let this drift to the point where we begin to hate each other? After we ask the question and come up hopefully with answers, we need to work hard to sort it out by injecting new life into the relationship. And you might be thinking in your head, well, that's a big ask here, Steve. What are you saying things like that for? Well, it will take no more effort than it takes to build up a new relationship with someone else. That's the point. If you were going to put into your marriage, your worn out, tread, uh, treadbare marriage, the same effort that you're going to put into a new relationship which you were trying to build up with someone else, the old marriage, the old worn out marriage would regain the sparkle. The response would be good. Things could be sorted out. But again, doing the right thing is always the hard thing to do. The easiest thing in the world is, oh, I'm sick of it. I just need to move on here. And I saw somebody I really like, so I'll start chasing <coughs> and get the excitement of the chase and falling in love and being euphoric about the whole situation again. And you get married. And years down the line, the relationship becomes predictable <laughs> and humdrum <laughs> and you're back where you started. You see, that's why in California and other places where they can afford it, there are five and six marriages down the road because they're still looking for that excitement all the time. We've got to be realistic. Life just isn't excitement all the time. It's hard work. And if you're serious about life and eternal life, it's even harder. But if we remember that God hates divorce, it will bring a sense of urgency to both of us to resolve the problems. Now let's have a look at what Jesus says on divorce and remarriage. We need to go to Matthew chapter 19. Jesus' teaching is in direct response to a question that was asked him uh, with regard to divorce. This question was raised by the Pharisees they lived under the law, they knew the law, and, uh, and of course they were trying to use the, the difficulties that they had found with the law to entrap Jesus Christ and to, uh, to, to find some reason to point the finger at him, to blame him, to uh, dismiss him. So it was a, it's a, it, it was a question that was loaded it was full of entrapment. But what they didn't realize is that they were dealing with the Son of God. 
And he knew the scriptures better than they knew the scriptures. And he was able to explain the scriptures in a way that showed that their whole thinking about divorce and remarriage was wrong. Let's just read here what, uh, what's going on. Uh, beginning with verse 3, I'll just read through it first. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And he puts the emphasis on that. They are no longer two, but one flesh. It's like they're one person. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate, he says. Reminds us once again, very important, importantly, that God, not the government, not the commissioner of oaths, not anybody, but God has joined the people together. And that's what needs to be seen in this, uh, in this subject. That it's God who joins us together. And that will bring the seriousness back into the marriage thing. Anyway, he says in verse 8, And he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another one commits adultery. Let me read that again. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, let's leave out the exception for a minute. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Now that's the rule. What's the exception? He says, except for immorality or fornication. He makes that one exception. It's interesting that Jesus says, Moses allowed divorce as a concession to your hardness of hearts. He now applies it to the, to the Pharisees and to the people of his generation. But Moses didn't live in that generation. He lived way back. And it was for his generation, those who had lived in Egypt, those who had drawn deeply of the Egyptian ways and customs, whose hearts were already hardened against what God wanted, and were more open to what the nations were doing. So, he's saying to them here, look, it was not God, but Moses, who allowed this concession. And that was uh, very important for them to see. Um, Jesus also gives us an answer to what, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm here. Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, he permitted it because of the hardness of your heart. But Jesus is now saying that unless divorce is for fornication, the person who is divorced and has not divorced for fornication and marries somebody else is sinning. They're in an adulterous situation. Jesus.
Jesus eliminates the any reason at all for divorce. It is simply not permitted by God. Now, let me make this observation. In Christianity, the rule is no divorce. But Jesus made one exception. One exception to the rule. And that is for fornication. Now we all know and are aware that the Catholic Church has taken the stand that there is simply no reason for divorce at all. But then you come to a passage like Matthew chapter 19 and Jesus who claimed to have all authority in heaven and on earth he says except for fornication. Now whose word are you going to take? Are you going to take the word of Jesus? Or are you going to take the stand of the Catholic Church? I know why they took the stand. I can understand why they decided just no divorce. It makes it much simpler for, for them. Much easier. But Jesus said except for fornication. And if Jesus said it, who has all authority, we must accept it. Regardless of the difficulties that it might bring, we must accept it. Let's have a look at this in Luke chapter 16, verse 18. It says in verse 16, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since then the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Adultery. Luke here is not dealing with the exception Jesus made for divorce. What, it, what he does make clear is that he's dealing with the man who divorces his wife unlawfully. Not dealing with the exception. He's dealing with what was happening. They were divorcing their wives unlawfully. That is not for fornication. And the one who divorces his wife but not for fornication and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries the one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery as well. So you can see the rule is no divorce. But there is one exception. And he's saying in this verse that this is consistent with the law of Moses. That this is actually what Moses was saying. That they had no right just to divorce willy-nilly because they hated their spouse. The exception necessarily infers that the innocent party can remarry without committing adultery. Otherwise, why make the exception? Think about that. If the exception is not an exception, and even though there's adultery involved in it, if he divorces and remarries, he's in an adulterous situation, then why did Jesus make an exception? What is the exception from? Does a righteous God treat the innocent in exactly the same way as he treats the guilty? The innocent party can't remarry. The guilty party can't remarry. 
exactly the same. Why are both of them being punished in the same way? The truth is, in Luke 16, and in Matthew 5, and in Matthew chapter 19, and in Mark chapter 10, he's dealing with the unlawful divorce and remarriage, which leaves the one who has been unlawfully divorced in an adulterous situation. Whereas the one, as Matthew 19 points out, Jesus in Matthew 19 points out, the one who will divorce for the exception is the exception and has the right to remarry. Now, sometimes the Apostle Paul, in the instructions that he gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, are brought into play, um, suggesting that there's other reasons for divorce and also uh, for other reasons. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to deal with it section by section because it's quite a, quite a big chapter, a long chapter. Um, I've explained uh, verses 1 uh, to 1 through 5 in my lesson on marriage. So I'm not going to go into this again right now. I'm just taking it for granted, you know, that a man is married not only to procreate, but to save himself or a woman is married to save herself from immoralities. This is part and parcel of what marriage is for. And that means a certain mindset within the marriage from each spouse to be willing to give themselves to become one flesh with each other and uh, not to deprive each other of uh, uh, such a union. Uh, except for prayer for a certain amount of time. Otherwise, we might be tempted for the lack of self-control. Um, and then he goes on to say, well, he wishes that all men were just like himself. In other words, that they'd be single. Paul was a single man. He wasn't a married man. He was a single man. Now, he's saying this for very good reason. And I want to draw it to your attention from the very start. In verse 26, he tells us, I think then that this is good in view of the present distress. It is good for a man to remain as he is. If he's a single man, he needs to remain a single man. If he's a widower, he needs to remain a single man. If he's uh, uh, contemplating marriage, he needs to think again about it because there was a persecution looming. If it hadn't already started, it was looming and the persecution would change everything. And so when he's giving the advice or, or when he's saying, I wish that he were like myself, he's just saying, because under these new circumstances, which I'm writing to you about, it would be better to be single than to be married. And we don't have to explain in detail why that would be the case. If you're being persecuted, all you've got to worry about is yourself uh, and not worry about a wife and children. And um, that will help you to focus your mind on undistracted devotion to the Lord during that period of time, which you will absolutely need to do because that's the only thing that will take you through a persecution of a severe nature. Uh, so this, this is what he's outlining here for us from verses 1 through 40. Um, Paul is, is giving concessionary instructions in view of the persecution to the unmarried and the widows. He tells them to remain even as I am or in the single state, as we can see from verses 8 and 9. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I. 
But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to born. Now the born here means either born with passion, or born in hell, or maybe it means both. Maybe it means born with passion and born in hell. You can make up your own mind on that. But one way or the other, he's, he's telling them, look, uh, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that you stay the way you are, but if you do not have self-control, in other words, if you feel that you absolutely need to be married, he says, then get married. You haven't sinned if you get married. You have created a situation in which you're going to find yourself with more difficulties than you would have if you had remained single, with more worries than you would have had if you had remained singled, with more uh, problems that you would have had if had you remained singled. But if the passion or the desire is so great, then he says, get married. It's better to be married than to be overwrought with passion and being tempted to immorality. Okay. To the married, uh, he says, uh, Paul affirms that the Lord has already, what the Lord has already said, that a wife should not leave her husband. This is verses 10 and 11. As to the married, I give instruction, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband should stay together, work it out together. Again, he deals with a situation which would arise or had arisen. He says, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife, he says. Now it's always troubled me as to why she would have left and the only thing I can find in the context that would explain it would be that if there was a persecution on the church and it was going to get worse, she, like many a mother, would feel that I'm in danger and the children are in danger. I mean, when Paul was persecuting the church, he and his fellow persecutors would go into house after house of the Christians, children or no children, into house after house and drag out the people who are Christians, no doubt not in any nice, kind way, but with severity. And uh, can you imagine what it would have been like for children to be in a situation where the house was being raided, where their mommy and daddy was being dragged out and beaten and hauled off to prison and they were left on their own to cope with the whole situation. So in view of what that, that sort of scenario, the wife decides, now this is just my opinion, okay? I'm not forcing this on anybody. I'm just trying to explain it for, for my own satisfaction. Why would she leave? And then I thought, well, because of violence um, and um, because she now believes that they are in danger of being violently treated. So she leaves the husband to find a safer place. Now, if that was the case, okay, he says, you, she can leave, but she must remember that she has to remain unmarried. Just because you're in a, a better place and maybe getting attention from other people uh, doesn't mean that now the husband's not around or the wife's not around, that you are free to do what you like. He says, no, no, that's not the case. The marriage bond has not been broken. You're still married and you need to stay unmarried in that situation or be reconciled to your husband. That's the only alternative here, or be reconciled to your husband. And the, the reconciliation is very much in keeping with what Christianity is all about, very much. It's about forgiveness. It's about love. It's about understanding and compassion. 
It's about trying to help each other through the difficulties of this life. It's about all of that. And if that attitude prevails, people can, can see, uh, or should be able to see, that no, my partner is not immune, my, my, my wife or my husband is not immune to the difficulties internally and externally that life brings. And we all make mistakes, we all sin. And even if there is adultery or fornication, it doesn't have to be, I'm going to stick by the letter of the law, this is what I have to have, this is what I want, without taking into consideration, well, did I create a problem here? Was I partly to blame here? Why should I then be so high and mighty, so righteous, so looking down on the one I've driven maybe into the arms of another man? Or if it's the wife of the husband who's been driven into the arms of another woman? Why not us all take responsibility for the way the situation is and the, and the outcome of that situation? Most of us are guilty to some extent. And there should be a desire to work it out, to ask why, to see our own, to see our own part in this problem, and to make amends by repenting and promising to do better in the days ahead. So, but in the in this situation, she leaves, let her leave, but let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. There was a situation where there was believers married to unbelievers. And uh, he deals with that now uh, from verse 12 to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. Now why would he have to say that? Well you see, under the old covenant, if you read in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, <coughs> under the old covenant, believers under the old covenant were to divorce their unbelieving wives or husbands. And that was mandatory. Now under the new covenant, Christians might have thought, well, they had to leave their unbelieving wives. That gives me the right to divorce my unbelieving wife. But the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells them that Christians have no right to divorce their unbelieving partners, especially when those unbelieving partners want to remain with them. So he's not giving them any license, he's taking away what they thought might be a license from them and allowing them to say, no, you've got as much obligation to your unbelieving spouse as a believer would have to a believing spouse. And you have no right to divorce her. Things have changed since the Old Testament. Under Christ, no right to divorce. And it goes on, and a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Sometimes in this discussion it seems like the women have, no, have any rights, but the women could get divorced. And the women did have the right to divorce. And they did have a right to put away their husbands. And he's telling her, you're not to use that right in this circumstance, just because he's unbelieving. And then he explains in verse 14, for the, husband, the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband for otherwise your children are unclean but now they are holy. What does that mean? Sanctifying means accept, acceptance by God of the unbeliever as a legitimate spouse for the believer. Also the offspring of this union are not to be considered illegitimate children, 
but are acceptable to God. Therefore, they are holy to the Lord. It's just sanctified in the sense that they are acceptable to the Lord. Not in any uh, wonderful transference of forgiveness and righteousness from the believer to the unbeliever. That's not what he's talking about. There, there is no transference here. It just means that the union, the marriage, is acceptable before God. The offspring of that union is acceptable before God. Of course, if the unbeliever leaves, the husband or wife is not under bondage to supply her food. If it's the wife that leaves, her clothing or her conjugal rights. But it doesn't give, seem to give them the person who's left behind the right to divorce. From verse 17 onwards to verse 24, Paul is saying, look, <coughs> Stay in the condition that you're in. He, he talks about it in terms of circumcision, uh, of, um, of being a, a slave or a free man. Um, but the, the application goes much further than that. Uh, he says, if you're circumcised, don't seek to be uncircumcised. There must have been some sort of drift or movement towards an operation which they could get to make themselves uncircumcised. Uh, don't ask me about the details, I don't know. I just know that, that was, it was possible. Uh, and then he says, uh, if you're uncircumcised, not to become circumcised. If you're a slave, don't be worried about it. If time is short right now and things are not going to be the same for very long, just stick with what you're doing. Uh, and if you're a freed man, don't get yourself involved in slavery. Uh, so he, he's, he's saying all of these things, but uh, he, he also is um, including the idea that uh, if you're single, remain single. If you're married, remain married. If you're not married, then don't try to be married right now because it's not the time to be thinking about that. It's time to think about your soul and preserving your life here on this earth for as long as you can. Uh, and that, that's, that's what is the application is to here. Uh, verse 24 sums it up. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in the condition in which he was called. I think that sums it up quite well here. Now, when he gets on to this last section, he's talking about virgins. Um, he had no command of the Lord, but he gave his opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy, verse 25. Again, he reiterates, I think, that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. He's just setting up again what he, generally what he had said, and now he's going to apply it to the virgins. Um, he says, um, but if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. But this, I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not uh, possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away, and I want you to be free from concern. The one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. The one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and the interests are divided. So he, he's just setting up a, a scenario for us. If, if we read Isaiah 24, 1 through 6, and I'm not going to go there because I don't have enough time to do that. But you put it in your notes, Isaiah chapter 24, 1 through 6. He describes a catastrophe situation um, uh, in, in those verses and shows that 
the buying and selling, everything goes. We, we can see just from the pictures on the television uh, of late uh, about uh, uh, Syria and um, some of the stalls are coming back out on the roads because they're having a, a, an interlude between wars but some of the stalls start to come back out and they're selling fruit and vegetables and all the rest of it. Up to that point they had to scratch for water, for food, uh, people were starving to death. Uh, this, is, this is the way ordinary life changes during uh, violence and violent situations and it's, if, if, you're, if you're going into one, you better be prepared for one. Now thank God we're at peace, but violence is always knocking at the door. And persecution is always knocking at the door. And to think that we might get away with it might be foolish thinking. So brace yourself and have, have a good understanding of what might be and what could come and be prepared to deal with it. But in terms of the, in terms of the Virgin, you see that there's a naughty problem here because the Virgin uh, was under her father's authority while she was living in her father's house. And because marriages were arranged in that day and time, uh, it was the parents who arranged it. So, uh, but now it wasn't without the consent of the Virgin daughter, but still they had a major say in, the, in these matters and they decided for for, for the virgin daughter. So he has to give advice to, uh, uh, or he has to address the situation where the father or the man, um, and by saying man, he broadens it out, it could have been the man who's engaged to a virgin, uh, and he might have to consider this as well. Um, but he's saying, uh, if, if you think you're acting unbecomingly towards your, your virgin daughter, who has passed her youth, uh, and um, and uh, just uh, uh, she's past her youth, uh, and she wants to get married. He says, "If it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry." So he's telling the fathers how to act under these circumstances. If the pressure is on the father, from the young virgin daughter, to get married, he says, you can let her marry. You're not, you're not doing anything wrong. You're not sinning. She's not sinning if she gets married. However, if there's a young virgin daughter who's not putting any pressure on the father, and it's the father's belief that she's better off staying this way, given what we're going to have to face, he says that if he keeps her in that way, he's doing better because of the situation. So. One way or the other, uh, there was permission to marry, but it was better if you didn't marry. And that's what he was trying to tell the parents here. Then in verse 39 and 40, he says, A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to marry, uh, free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Now this, this verse is very much tied uh, the same as Romans chapter 7, 1 through 4. A man is bound to his wife, as long as they're married. But if he's dead, then she can remarry again if she wishes. Now, what that, all that means is the Apostle Paul is not dealing with the exception here. He's dealing with the rule. The rule being no divorce, marriage for life. But he is saying that if the husband is dead, that marriage bond is broken. There's no need for you to be worried if you're going to join yourself to another man in marriage. And he says, you have every right to do that. He puts a proviso in only in the Lord, in that pick a Christian. At least don't make that mistake. Pick somebody who is spiritually minded, who loves the Lord and wants to do right, to be your new spouse and let that, let that be a blessing to you in life rather than going off and marrying somebody who's just going to bring you hardship and heartache because they don't believe. But she's happier in those circumstances if she remains as she is, the widow. Let her stay a widow. She'll be better off. She can handle the situation that's going to come because she doesn't have to worry about anybody else at this stage. Okay.
that's pretty well it. Um, I, I just dealt with this section because I want us to see that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 does not alter one whit what Jesus Christ had allowed in Matthew chapter 19 that a person can get, legitimately get, divorced for fornication and by necessary inference can remarry without committing adultery. That's the teaching. Now, I know I've just given it to you as dryly and as um, forthrightly as I can. I wasn't involved, try not to be involved in the emotion of this thing. There was this explosive emotions are involved in all of these situations. And uh, I just uh, want you to know that, I mean, there'll be other lessons at other times about how we can be compassionate and kind and good and and uh, ease the, pro the difficulties that are involved. But it's very, very, uh, I have to get this grounding in there first so that we know where we stand and there's no question as to what is necessary. Otherwise, the emotion enters in and reason goes out the window and we become unscriptural. And it's so easy to do that. Brethren, Think about these things. I'll leave it with you.